there is a different definition of enlightenment that the two of you have, uh, different understandings, and also a different understanding around um, embodiment and mutuality that I'm interested in. And, yeah, my curiosity was around the two of you having a conversation around your experiences with awakening, higher consciousness, and where there might be similarities between the two of you and then where there might be differences as well. Okay, great. Enlightenment, embodiment, mutuality. So let's start with enlightenment. Um, I... Okay, I just I'll just put out my you know how I feel about the word, which is that it seems to have ended up becoming a sort of catch-all that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And because of that, it needs some, I think, pretty clear definition, either clear definition or what I do is I don't use it because uh, you, what I find is when I use that word, it just triggers a bunch of idealistic notions about what will happen when the great, you know, kaboom happens to me and the light goes on and everything becomes beautiful or something like that. And I find that um, difficult because I try to be as precise as possible with people about the different stages of development. So, um, you know, that's actually why I spent years working on the creation of the iConscious model so that we could get really specific about these different, on average, stages that open up different kinds of experiences at different levels of our being that also are going to change and be unique according to the specific, unique design of each person. So... Anyway, that's just my first thought out there. I'd love to hear what you want to say, Vishwan. Yeah, well, I've come, come basically through a traditional methodology, even though my original teacher was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Uh, I got involved with the, uh, the Ramana Maharshi crowd, uh, Advaita Vedanta, and I was uh, an Advaita Vedanta teacher for about 10 years. Um, for me, what happened, because I started when I was young, like yourself, uh, when I was 19, and uh, basically removing limiting belief systems because I was into personal growth. Yes. Uh, and that, that, that really, really helped a great deal because we, we have so many programs that are limiting. And That's uh, for sure. Along with that, I, I removed victim-orientated thinking, um, which was very difficult to remove, but I did remove it. Uh, I just would not uh, let myself be a victim of anything, or anyone, or myself. And that set me up for being very present to reality because when you're not being a victim, you, you, you're quite present a lot of the time. And so I found meditation very easy when I got into it when I was 28 with uh, Bhagwan. Uh, I didn't have a problem finding, the no, not finding no mind because I'd been looking for it my whole life uh, in, in dangerous sports, racing oh. motorbikes, uh, racing, rallying cars, uh, deep sea diving, rugby, uh, full contact martial arts. And so... Oh. When, you, when you're in that kind of thing for long periods of time, you have to be present for long periods of time. So I found meditation very easily. I didn't have an understanding of what enlightenment was, even though I had a conceptual understanding from what Osho was teaching, until I was walking along a foreshore uh, of a river one day, and for about four hours I'd been asking the question, who am I? and answering it and then discounting the answer, which is a Zen methodology of self-inquiry. And I found myself, I came back with the answer, uh, I, I am absolutely empty, absolutely nothing. And an echo started, and it was like an echo. I, I can only describe it as that. And there was this expansion of the mind, and then I found myself as every particle in the universe. And every particle in the universe was love. 
Well, that blew my socks off. That fired up the thirst because I came back to ego-based reality after that. It fired up the thirst for enlightenment. I nearly killed myself trying to find it again. Bought a float tank, uh, experimented with LSD, uh, underwater speakers, th- running uh, Tibetan bowls through the uh, through the wow. tank for a, you know six hours at a time. Coming out like uh, rage body came out, um, repressed emotions came out. Um, there was a willingness to feel it, so it was all expressed. Um, I wouldn't talk to anybody while that was happening <laughs> because it was too dangerous. Uh, but that went on for a long time. And then I, then Osho died uh, in 1990. And in a way, I had already, I, I gave up this pursuit of enlightenment and decided that I was going to live the way of the heart because during the process of seeking enlightenment, I'd found my heart. I'd found unconditional love. And that made my mind feel that it just wanted to help everyone in some way. And so I went back to school and I trained as a naturopath and psychotherapist so I could have some tools to help people with. And I, was, I went into service and I just loved it. It was my love affair with humanity. My love affair with life was to be in service to other humans in whatever capacity I could be, even if that was helping someone change a tire or just smiling at someone or you, using psychotherapy to help them through their pain body or whatever. I just loved being in service. And mm. I considered that to be manageable happiness. I was happy because I was in service. But then the Advaita Vedanta teachers came to town and my whole process through that next nine years was the practice of openness. So if anything at all contracted me or created resistance in me, I considered that above zero. I would start looking at what belief system supported that contraction, what belief system supported the resistance. And I'd find a way to undo the belief system until there was nothing left, until people could insult me or do whatever they like and nothing would move inside of me. And I was in relationship with someone I didn't get along with, someone I loved dearly, but I didn't get along with. And so she was my best teacher because she showed me all the places I was still stuck inside, uh, still hadn't shown up with uh, unconditional surrender and love, places I hadn't undone belief systems, injustice, whatever. Um, it, it's not fair as a beauty. Uh, but what happened was then an Advaita Vedanta teacher came to Perth where I live and started running a retreat down in Denmark. I paid for the retreat in advance and then I watched a video of him and went, God, I don't want to go near this guy. But <laughs> I'd already paid, so I went all the way down to Denmark, which is 400 kilometres away. And the moment he walked in the room, because he was carrying a presence, awakening happened again. And I found myself as the universe. And I found myself as every particle being love. Now, for the next year, it was on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. Mm -hmm. And then it was on. And there was nobody anymore. There was just space. And it's been like that now for 23 years. Just nobody here, just space. So people so, say... In all of that experience, what would you refer to as enlightenment? Awareness being aware of itself continuously. Because it's always, a, it's always aware of itself continuously. So the idea of identification with anything, including that, is ridiculous to my mind. Yes, yes. Yeah. I totally uh, understand. And what happened? People started coming to sit with me. They started to want to sit with me because they could <laughs> feel the presence. Yeah. And that's how it all began. That's how satsang began. And, of course, I only had one model, really. I, I, I had the Osho model and I had the Advaita Vedanta model, and I chose the Advaita Vedanta model because it was easier to do. And it was more sure. westernized. Yeah. So um, to, to, I just want to address Maitreya again. Um, Maitreya, uh, to address especially you because you were asking this question, 
um, the way I read uh, what you just told me, Vishwant, is that you're living in what I call stage 13, 14, or the third phase in the model that we've developed, and that you got to it in your own way that's a little off from the average way that people come to it. Because my observation of the average is that first they come to uh, awaken, consciousness awakens to itself. But that can happen in a rather disembodied sort of way. In other words, consciousness can get itself very clearly. And I had that, you know, a very clear consciousness shift, uh, the, I don't know, 96 or something. Um, but that wasn't the same as the unity experience. And you've had unity experiences sort of both before and after that kind of realization. And, but in my experience of what average is, that people first get the, the consciousness recognition, then they get to the place where they are willing to have the consciousness fully be present in the body with the emotions, the physical sensations, present with whatever's going on in the mind and present with whatever personality issues are present. And there's a realization in that of no separateness between consciousness and anything else. Now I've heard in something you said, Vishrant, that you've had that experience a number of times till it's stabilized. Yes, that's usually what happens in my experience. Usually people you know, will kind of get the consciousness piece. Maybe they'll have some flashes of unity. Maybe they'll have flashes of no self, but I, I see that on average as more advanced. And then they fall into the recognition of unity and they realize, you know, I am everything. And then later, when they come all the way back into the world, you know, and they let go of their spiritual identity and all that, and they sort of re-enter the, you know, the marketplace, according to the old Zen teachings, um, there is an eventual letting go of, as you say, all identifications. And that is what I call stage 13 and the realization of that. And then stage 14 in, 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 the, in the model I work with is flow. It's what happens when that realization of no self is so stabilized that um, you all you're aware of is just like, all there is is flow. It's not that you're flow, you're God. All there is is flow. And I think I suspect you can identify with that. That's how it is. It's all flow. I call it play. Everything is play. Uh -huh. Everything yes. is play. Um, any form of stuckness, well, there isn't any. So there, there we yeah, go. Right. But to get embodied again, because I've heard you talk about embodiment, uh, I started teaching martial arts again. Yes. Uh, medieval martial arts where you wear armor and you go full contact. Wow. And I found that uh, even though I wasn't there, I had to be in my body very firmly in uh, awareness-wise to actually play yes. that game. I also found that I was drifting off about 15 years ago into just wanting to sit still and not talk to anyone. And so I bought a, a high-powered motorbike. And I found that because uh, when you're on a high-powered motorbike, if you're not present, you're going to die. That's as, that's as simple as that. And it enabled me to stay out. And the group of people who were coming to see me all bought motorbikes as well. So we started our own motorbike club. Oh, that's so, cool. So there's been this adventure in staying out here while being gone because uh, I want to help people get free. Yes. And I can't. And I think that if I go too deep in, I'll become ineffective as a teacher, ineffective as a guide, basically, because there's something inside of me that would love to sit in my room and do nothing all day long every day. Yes, I understand. Yeah. Um, so embodiment. I think that um, you you strike me as a type eight on the Enneagram, which... Uh, I'm an eight. They're an eight, yeah. And the type eights are very body oriented. Mm. And, uh, so I think very natural for you to really bring your awakening into your body the way you're describing. And yet I, I find that 
I feel it in the hands. I feel it in the feet. You know, it's like it's there. It's not. Yeah. It's not. There's not a disassociation. Yet there's no one. It, there's no one here. Like it's not. Like there's an, an idea that that's my hand. It's a hand, but awareness is in the hand. It's hard to say, but this is. Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, I, I think I wouldn't even say awareness is in the hand because that almost makes it sound like it's two things. Um, I can feel it. It's locked in before, before, um, before, uh, uh, what I call awakening or enlightenment, I worked as a naturopath and, and psychotherapist, but what I loved doing was deep tissue massage. And some days I do eight hours of deep tissue massage and you have to be present to your hands. You have to be present to the body of the yeah. person you're dealing with. Otherwise you hurt them. And yeah. so I had all this practice at being in the body before um, awakening occurred. I, I think that's great. And I think that um, I kind of wish more spiritual, you know, quote, spiritual teachers would uh, help people get more in their bodies because um Without that, people tend to to have awakening experiences that are more disembodied and think that that's, oh, they've attained the ultimate self and that's the end of the line or something crazy like that. And um, I think that's a mistake. And apparently we agree on that point. Well, I have no idea what the end of the line is. <laughs> right. I don't think there could be any possible thing like that. It could be. Um I just love everybody. I mean, I, I, I can't help it. I love you to bits. I love these two guys sitting here. I just, it's just how it is. Yeah. And uh, what, what I, I watched a little bit of a video of you because I wanted to see what I was dealing with. And you said that you were here to wake up the people. Well, we have that in common. That's what I'm here for too. Yes. And um, uh, that that's because I wasn't going to actually, I don't tend, tend to talk to other teachers. Um, I wasn't going to talk to you, but when I heard you say that, I felt that I would like to say hello. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. Because I think it's the only thing on the planet that's worth doing. I, that's exactly the way I put it. Because, mm. you know, there's all this, I, I mean, I could see this from when I was very young. It was obvious to me that... Um, the technology that's coming had such both positive and negative potentials that if, as long as people were not being very mature with the decisions they're making, um, we're just going to blow ourselves up. You know, we're going to mess ourselves up, which obviously is what's happening. Mm. And uh, so, you know, I'm a little different this way. I am... Uh, I have a very positive outlook on what can be done in a good way to spread awakening through um, internet-based applications that mm. will help people actually wake up using the kinds of um, you know social media platforms and gaming and everything else that they're already on. That's the place I think to get their attention. And I'm aware of a lot of people who think that um, technology is all bad and it's all moving toward everyone's going to get controlled but i don't take that approach at all i think it's time to bring it to the people through every possible means i agree what i've found surprising since i started using zoom is there's a transmission through the internet and people are finding themselves uh as the space as a result of that transmission and reporting it back and that i'm so happy about that because of course yeah. when I was with osho it was like you had to be in the room with him basically yeah, I started noticing years ago that um, people, um, students I was working with would get the transmission through emails. I would just have these extended conversations through email, especially people in Europe who didn't have great English. So I would just have these conversations and yeah. they'd, be awake, they'd be waking up. And then as we got into Skype, same yeah. thing. It's like the transmission, it seems the transmission will go anywhere both parties have their attention together. I, I found that with reading Ramana and reading Osho, I could get the transmission through the books. Yes. Yep, yep. so I I've understand. Seen it happen. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, 
let's see, there was one other topic Maitreya brought up we might want to touch on, and that is mutuality, um, which to me is the sort of, in a sense, it's the embodiment of awareness in the relational department. So I guess the, the easy way to say what I think that mutuality is, is, or at least how I would define it, is the willingness of two people to um, understand that each has a different reality and that the different realities are both true in a relative sense. In other words, my truth is true, your truth is true, our truths are different, uh, and instead of making that a problem, we can actually make that a strength. We can support each other in our differences mm -hmm. and learn to live together with a kind of harmony that starts with an intentional leaning into the discomfort of differences and discovering that instead of avoiding that discomfort, we can embrace it. And actually, after embracing it for a while, we can um, move together and hold these various tensions of the differences without that being a problem. Non-resistant. Non-resistant. Non-resistance, non yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But that's still within the realms of the mind. Um, well, I, I wasn't thinking of it that way. I mean, sure, anytime you relate to another person, I think we relate on all levels. You know, which includes mind, emotions, body, consciousness, everything that we are is relating. Um, so what I, you know, the practice of mutuality that uh, many of my friends and I are into has to do with, um, yeah, like leaning and starting out by leaning into what appears to be discomfort. And the reason I think it's mostly so uncomfortable is because we grew up in uh, a generation where the parents didn't have any clue about these basic simple ideas, such as my truth is true and your truth is true. Mm. That one wasn't even very much out on the table. There was a lot of competition for who's got the right truth mm. uh, in right. families, in dharmas, in everything, really. Mm. And so people are, um, you know, tending to think that, okay, well, this person is the authority, so they have the truth. So people give up their authority and their truth in the presence of the strong other truth. Mm -hmm. And that's something I discourage people from doing, because I think everybody needs to really land in their own truth, which is the same as, ultimately the same as embodying their uniqueness. If they're not embodying their uniqueness, then there's still some part of them that's sort of resisting themselves. So, so from my perspective, that's still in the realms of psychotherapy. Okay. And I don't you, have you a might have a that. wider definition than I do of psychotherapy. Well, well I, I, I use psychotherapy methodologies to help people communicate with each other. Um, one of them, my favorite ones, is uh, if you're going to have a disagreement, make sure you're on the other person's side as well as your own. Oh, that's great. And that works because then the truth doesn't get sacrificed. If you're only on your own side, that's when war begins. Absolutely right. Absolutely mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's beautiful. Do people get it from you explaining it like that? They do get it. Yeah. You've got to put you got to be on your side and you've got to be on the other side during the conversation, even if you don't agree with them. You've got to be on their side. And because you're on their side, you'll yeah. listen to them and they'll feel heard. If yes. you're only on your own side, there's a good chance they won't feel heard, and there's a good chance you might start lying to win. <laughs> Absolutely. They yeah. say in they say in war the first casualty of war is the truth. <laughs> well, I guess there must be a lot of war on the planet. Unfortunately, we seem to be in a post-truth reality. Well, the planet is not doing so well um, because yeah, people are so victim oriented They keep blaming each other for this and that, and not taking responsibility for themselves, which I put down to immaturity. We have a very immature population of human beings on the planet at the moment. And because of that immaturity, it takes them into lower consciousness. It takes them into contraction and resistance and puts them out of touch with their own hearts so they can't perceive love. 
And when you can't perceive love, you're left with a survival mechanism. Right. That's right. Me out for myself. Got to make sure I survive, whatever it takes. That's it. And, you know, from my perspective, there's a level of everybody where that operates. Like, you know, if it comes right down to it, um, you know, not everybody, but, you know, like Buddha, when it came right down to it, so, uh, supposedly the story was he uh, preferred to let the, his host serve him, po you know, uh, poisoned food, not poisonous, but it was food that had gone bad rather than, you know, make them feel bad about serving it. And so he died from that. But most people would not do that. No. Most people, you know, if they, if it's, you know, if it's down to, I'm going to die if I don't get this food in my body and that's the only food there is, they'll go after it. And I think that's okay. But I think most people don't have to operate on that level most of the time, especially in developed nations. I look you know, at it with, with death because death's the understanding of death is important because if you can't understand death, you can't understand surrender. So death is like the loss of control, the same as insanity is like the loss of control. If we can be okay with the loss of control, we can be awfully free, even if, even if awareness is not aware of itself because the survival mechanism has been defeated. And so a lot of the work that I do with people is teaching them how to accept life, how to let go. And also at the same time, witnessing the mind so they can see what they need to let go of, of which course. is very traditional, you know, very traditional yes. watching the mind, yes. witnessing the mind and, and then accepting what's seen and then maybe moving to change or not moving to change, but from a place of higher consciousness rather than a place of lower consciousness which is just reactivity. Yeah. Well, I totally agree. I mean, I think it's incredibly clear that the whole um, impulse to protect the <laughs> false sense of self um, is the whole thing. You know, that's what causes the control, the resistance, the uh, contraction around that whole pattern of self survival. Yeah, you know, you know when it's about the body, okay, yeah, we need our body to survive. But when it's about protecting ourselves from feeling uncomfortable, yeah, the whole world is horribly conditioned against feeling discomfort. Yes, I agree. It's the, absolutely we're on the same page. It's like the willingness to feel our wounding, the willingness to feel discomfort, is freedom. The unwillingness to feel it, that resistance, is actually suffering pain is pain pain is not suffering the resistance to pain is suffering absolutely totally mm. agree I, I talk about it like that all the time so you talked about leaning into this is not my terminology but i understand what you're saying rather i call it warmly welcoming yes i call it warmly welcoming sometimes <laughs> i call it actually sometimes i call it welcoming practice mm. and uh, sometimes i call it warmly welcoming sometimes radical welcoming Mm. But it's all the same idea, right? It's the only thing that, you know, it doesn't, obviously it doesn't work to tell people to stop resisting, but what does work is to just get them to practice welcoming. Yes. Yes. I, I created a game for myself, which I try to teach people. It's called the game of zero. At zero, you're totally relaxed. You're really cool. Anything above zero, there's a problem. There's tension there. And so the game is, Let's find out what that tension is and let's get back to zero. Let's find a way to remove whatever it is that's causing that tension, whatever obstacle, whatever belief system that's causing that tension, and then get back to zero. And so I played zero for almost nine years with my wife, with my client base, with my children, with my friends. And it's a game, it's a game that actually has you annihilate the ego in a lot of ways because the ego itself loves to be right loves to you know you're wrong i'm right kind of deal of course and the game of zero starts to undo the ego because you have to un to to get back to zero you have to undo the belief systems that support the ego's position so i mean i think i think that's great and um i'm i could see that there could be a potential glitch in how that is described to people or how they understand it because I think it'd be really easy for somebody to hear that description and go into um, 
thinking that every time they feel something that they don't like, that they have to do something about it. Ah, uh, any time that I feel anything that I didn't like, I'd allow myself to feel it. Yeah, so you, yes. you're getting a you're getting a brief, not the totality of the teaching. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it is very, very much about allowing yourself to feel whatever appears with a tender okayness, and that runs counter to our survival mechanism. So it's hard to learn, and it has to be practiced. Yes. Absolutely. And when we get down to it, from my perspective, it's practice and only practice that really works. The collection of knowledge doesn't work. Uh, intellectual understanding doesn't work. Only practice works. Yeah, I generally agree with that. And I find that, um, you know, there's different kinds of yogis. This is like talked about in the Vedas, but there are the Gyani yogis who are the mental types. And the mental types, I, I'm, I'm a mental type. And uh, I find that what really works for me is to understand where I'm going. And then when I understand where I'm going, then I can do the practice. Oh, I agree. And so Absolutely. I tend to attract, you know, a lot of people who are similar. Yeah. They ask me tons of questions because I was asking tons of questions. So they ask me tons of questions. I give them tons of answers and then they're free to like, oh, okay, thanks. Now I'll go practice. <laughs> Yeah, I've watched the way you communicate with different people, particularly when they're yeah. challenging or they're saying things that you mightn't be 100% on. You have a way of dealing with people. which You're a very good communicator. Oh, thank you. Mm. Um, because basically once communication ceases, well, it's the end of the game. And so you've got to keep the flow going, the communication going. And I see you doing that. I see you working that one as well from from what you've said so far to me and from what i've studied of you we don't have a disagreement of it at, at all Sorry, I I think we're on the same page i think so you know we might be using you know unique language but uh so does everybody and mm. that's why we're unique right so that we attract the people who uh want to hear what we have to say Mm. Well, one of the reasons that I had a slight bit of negativity towards you before I met you was because of Trillium. Because um, I got to I got to watch a few Trillium teachers, and I thought these guys are off. They're they're not teaching people how to wake up. They're teaching. They're just doing psychotherapy, and they're calling it awakening. Oh wow! Yeah, we'll see that. <laughs> Oh man, there's a that's a whole can of worms. Um, Tell me about Trillium it. Trillium was started by um, Samuel Bonder, who uh, came into his own unity awakening through the help of Dofri John, and um, I helped Samuel by creating the teacher training program and the mentor training program and uh, most of the big retreats and workshops, and. So since that time, it has become a lot of different things. It's not just one thing anymore. It's really a collective of teachers who, in my terminology, span, um, they all at least embody the unity realization, the embodied unity realization, full presence in the body, recognition of non-separation. Um, lots of them, though, don't um, have the experience yet of the no-self recognition mm. and so they're still working out material right and and their methodologies are all different and there's nothing about trillium that's trying to press people to all be on the same methodologies so no. it's not just one thing and i think it's easy to get an impression from watching this or that that may not translate to the rest of them Mm. And, um, you know, I, I'm still, I still belong to that organization. I don't participate much. I tend to spend more of my time just working with students and uh, working through the iConscious framework and training coaches in the iConscious framework because my experience is that when people, and back to the Gyani Yogi thing, when I give people a very clear model of a map of what this whole development process is about, on all the levels of uniqueness, uh, consciousness, uniqueness, mind, emotions, and body, when they see the whole, all the stages of it, um, they find them where they are and they see where they're going. 
and it makes it way easier to get there. Yeah. So that's kind of what I'm, that's part of what I'm about, making yeah. it as easy as possible. Yeah. Okay. So where where I went with Trillium uh, was that uh, they're telling people that they're awake and they're not. Well, I think they're telling, I think they're discriminating between what I call a consciousness awakening and what I would call embodied unity. Uh -huh. um, but I, there's no collective dharma at the moment about the no self recognition. Um, so I think they're reasonably good about that, but we'll actually, um, you know, I have my own discriminations to make about what I call awakening. And I, I think that's another word like enlightenment that is suddenly becoming difficult because everybody's using it for, you know, in different ways. But I think well, that uh, there is consciousness I, I, awakening. And I, I think there's... I do have a way of determining what's going on, and that's that if someone has a glimpse, it's a satori. It's not. It's a, it's a, a glimpse. It's not awakening. For me, awakening is twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. It's not something that comes and goes. And what I found with a lot of the trillium people um, is that they're actually t calling it enlightenment or calling it awake. And it's not. They've just had a glimpse, which I see as an invitation to do the work. That's all. Yeah, well, interestingly, one of the reasons I sort of went off and spent a bunch of years since 2015 working out the eye conscious model is to solve riddles like what happens when somebody uh, appears to awaken and appears to come into non-separation and then appears to lose the awakening or the non-separation. Yep. And uh, the way that group were, you know, uh, articulating it didn't wasn't dis discerning enough for my taste. Yeah, and I, part I, of I'm what got me on the page with you there, because people can find it and lose it. And uh, my understanding is, if they've lost it, the mind somewhere is not supporting it. The mind itself somewhere is probably supporting contraction, resistance to life, and awareness has gone back to the mind totally and away from itself. Yes. You know, I, I find that part of this is that there are certain kinds of people who have a tendency to just have radical shifts that stay permanent. Mm -hmm. Like me, maybe like you, I don't know, Ramana for sure, Nisargadatta for sure, Byron Katie, you know, um, lots of people, you know, Eckhart Tolle, a lot of people just, they just go kaboom, right? And it just happens and it never goes away. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not how I experience most people. Most people I find, they'll have Sataris, they'll go away, they'll have mm. a, another Satari, it'll go away. And that happens dozens or hundreds of times, which I find to be very natural, just as natural as the other approach just more common. And I think it's actually, I, the, you know, what I teach is it's okay that, you know, your being is integrating consciousness into your embodiment by taking you through these oscillations. It's actually, I think the original meaning of the yoga sutras was about suturing these parts of your being together. Uh -huh. So that's how I look at that. Playing with words, right. Uh, yeah. I, I, I actually have never been able to find um, meaning or purpose in life. Um, so I don't see anything guiding us. Um, I've been looking for meaning of life since I was a kid, and I haven't found one except life itself. And as far as purpose is concerned, really that's usually ego-based reality. Just the ego wants to feel important somehow, so it gives itself a purpose. And so I look at all of this, this, this that's going on, and I see that the ego wants awakening. It wants to have that as part of its credential. And so it finds a teacher that will acknowledge that it's awake. And unfortunately, there are teachers out there, particularly in the fight of a data field, that are telling people they're awake when they're not. And it doesn't serve anyone because it stops a person from doing the work that is probably required for them to wake up. Yes. And again, I think that's why I think it's so important to get our definitions clear. 
yeah. you know, if what you mean by wake up is where you are in the process, well, that's, you know, I, I find that it takes people years to get there. It certainly took me years to get there. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I have no doubt about that at all. You know, I've heard about it got Tolly is, and, and how he woke up on a bench and Byron Katie, something moved a cockroach or something, but, but most people take a long time. It's a process of, yes. from my perspective of undoing. Yes. It's like undoing all the, all of the mind that is in the way until yes. you are vulnerable enough and open enough to support what's been found. Yes, absolutely. There are the, yeah, there's always been people who talk about enlightenment as a subtraction process rather than an additive process. Well, I see it that way because I started yeah. with personal growth and I was very lucky that my personal growth was uh, with a group that was take was an encounter group and it was about taking beliefs away it was about taking things away that were limiting and of course that suited me down to the ground yes. when i got into spiritual growth because they're the same beliefs that are in the way yes yes well you got lucky i think most personal growth groups are not You're about lucky. that <laughs> well i got involved with a thing called the greatness in new seminar which was run in Australia, and it was a four-day encounter group where they just took you apart for four days and had you have a look at yourself, have a look what you're up to. And in that process, you get to see there was a lot of belief systems that weren't, weren't really serving you. And so you'd, you'd find a way to undo them and drop them. Yes, yes. Yes, you're, you're an all-in kind of guy. I can tell that. Total. <laughs> see, totality rules you see <laughs> from my perspective you know like it, whether you want to be an academic or a musician you're a businessman or a sports star or uh, you want to do higher consciousness totality is how you win it's very difficult to win if you're impartial if you're only partial yes well that's certainly true and so yes, Unfortunately, a lot of people who come are only partial, and as a result, they don't get very good results for themselves. Yes, um, absolutely. I think that until people are highly, are acutely aware of the pain of not being awake, uh, then they're not, they're just being partial, you know? It's just another sort of... Um, spiritual uh, you know spiritual materialism it's like another merit badge they're going after yes and, um you know that's that doesn't get you very far but you know it gets people moving along the path and at some point i think they start feeling the existential angst that is underneath everything that really is the is really the angst of resistance yeah well resistance is hell you know, that's what hell is. Hell is resistance to life. And it's created by your mind. It's not It's not out there. It's in here. And uh, heaven is love. <laughs> so if you're open enough, you can perceive love. If you're not open enough, you probably can't. But And if you're resisting life, you're closed. So you're, perce you're perceiving hell, which you're right. creating. Yes. Well, I think you and I are um, preaching to our choirs. Oh, I'm uh, sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I wonder if Maitreya has any more questions for us. Ah. <laughs> you, it's funny then. I miss I misheard you then, and I'll I'll let Maitreya talk. I misheard you. I thought you said, I wonder if my trainer has more oh. questions for me. And I thought you were talking about your wife, and I was gonna go, what? Oh no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Maitreya. Maitreya. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, you and I seem to be very much on the same page, and I'm curious now, Maitreya, if you're, you got any more questions for us? No, not really. I feel pretty spacious right now, and I think that conversation was wonderful. Like, yeah, there were so many things touched on, and I'm very happy to see the um, – the overlaps and the agreements coming forth, like different terminology, but the underlying principles are exactly the same. And I think that's that's awesome. <laughs> I think that's awesome too. Yeah. Yeah. I I find it uh, difficult to actually find people to talk to at the level that I'm talking to you at, with who actually understand what I'm saying. Yes. And there's a rarity. Yeah of people like that in the world it's really true in fact 
I, I would love to hear your guess how many people there are in the world who either of us could talk to on that level. Not many. No. I, I don't look for them either because I generally find when people are at a high consciousness level and enlightened, there's nothing to say to them. But you're operating as a teacher. Uh, you're trying to show people. You're trying to guide people, and that's where we're meeting. Yes. Uh, yes. In in methodology, in what works, what doesn't work. Yes. Uh, because I'm an explorer. I'll whatever whatever works. I'm into. You know, and whatever anyone uses, if it's working, well, that's the way. You know. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm and I, you know, part of what I'm doing is training coaches to be explorers for themselves like that too. You mm. know, to, you know, I give them all kinds of tools and techniques, but I'm also telling them, you know, find your way, experiment with all this stuff. You know, don't take what I'm saying as the gospel or anything like that. Just do your own experiments because it's really obvious to me that the way this kind of awakening grows is um like weeds growing you know it's got to, it's got to, it's got to mutate it's got to morph it's got to move through many different bodies and people and voices to get to reach all these different kinds of people out there yeah so i i celebrate the differences and i like you i try to be very discerning about uh you know dharmas that seem to be um uh, at lower stages of development i, I would put it yeah. Well, I still yeah. use the word satsang because um, a lot of people understand that word. And I hold satsang, uh, which is usually an hour to two hours long. But we sometimes call it meetings in truth. Yes. Um, but if, if I go totally Western, it's difficult because Westerners don't understand enlightenment. It's not part of our, our, our heritage. It's true, and as soon so, as you as soon as you use the word enlightenment, they they call it woo woo, and they look the other way. Well, no, and it, they think it's something to do with collection of knowledge and being able to repeat it, you know, yeah. uh, which is the English understanding of enlightenment, wisdom gained through knowledge. But it's not. It's not. <laughs> it's beyond. Right. Uh, clearly. Mm. Yeah. I have I have enjoyed our chat. Me too. I've really yeah. enjoyed our chat. And um, if you ever want to just chat again with or without cameras, mm. uh, fine with me. Happy to, I tend to, yeah, happy to, to hang out with you. I tend to try to record everything in case we can use it in some way to help people. Great. Why not? You know, sure. Um, yeah. If you don't mind, I'll post this on my site. And yeah, you welcome. You're welcome. Uh, we'll post it too. Because Great. I think I think it's important that people wake up. I think it's important that they find their hearts. I think the only thing that's going to save this planet actually is heart, love. And um, on the way to enlightenment, well, the openness supports the perception of love. So there you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so love you to bits. <laughs> love you to bits. Really great to meet you. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm. All right. We'll be in touch. I look forward to next time. Okay. Yeah. We'll have a chat. Uh, we'll have a maybe chat. We can just, you know, maybe someday we could just do it, you know, one or more, maybe a series on topics because we have our own angles on this stuff, but we seem so aligned. It might mm. be really fun to do a thing like that. I have not found anywhere where I've disagreed with you. Um, so I, there's, I, we just have different languaging for the same things. I think in a lot of ways we've come this, a similar way. You came through your old teachers as well originally. It feels that way. Mm. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I could I could introduce you to a few other people. I agree. There's not very many people operating at this level, but there are some. Ah. And, uh, it might be kind of fun to get you know a group of those people together at some point. But uh, on the other hand, you and I are both here to serve those who need to awaken. So um, yeah. I don't know that we're really going to actually do that. I find usually with people who are awake, because I do meet them, there's just nothing to say. Unless you're discussing teaching methodologies, there's nothing to say. The silence is so profound. I agree. <laughs> totally agree. Totally agree. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm. It's been lovely. It has been lovely.